inaugural edition of the first edition of the Global Synergy Conference. This event is held under the title Unifying Visions, Unlocking Sustainable Realities. The aim of the four panels we've organized today is to bridge the gap in understanding between our respective continents and discover ways to cooperate and engage in mutually beneficial manners to provide us with better insights on the goals of today over the courses of the discussions, the Q&As, and the many informal chats that you'll be having today, I hand over to the Martin Center's president, Mikolaj Zarinda. President, over to you. Thank you very much, fellow ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear friends. It is an honor to welcome you all to this landmark event, the Global Synergy Conference hosted by the Wilfrid Martin Center for European Studies. That is, as you may know, the official political think tank of the European People's Party. As the subtitle of this conference is, Uniting Visions, Unlocking Sustainable Realities, the role of Europe Asia and Latin America in the global economic transformation. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our guests from Southeast Asia and Latin America. Welcome. I would say that after the cloudless turn of the millennium, the world has gone through many upheavals in the last 15 years. First, we were hit by the global financial crisis, then by a massive wave of migration. The COVID-19 pandemic literally hit the whole world. So did Russia's war against Ukraine, as well as the brutality of Hamas on the 7th of October last year, with all the consequences that it seems are far from final. These shocks, compounded by deepening social divisions, culture wars, but also political polarization in many countries around the world, and above all, climate change, have led to, to a disruption of the world order and a questioning of the process of globalization. Henry Kissinger, in his book, does America need a foreign policy? More than 20 years ago wrote, short quotation, the gap between the economic and political worlds is the Achilles heel of the globalization process. It carries with it the risk of the emergence of two tire economies in developing countries. Perhaps 20% of these economies will become part of the transnational system, mostly as part of large multinational companies. The rest and most of the population at first may be left on the sidelines, the end of quotation. Developments in the world seemed to confirm Kissinger's thoughts at the time. Even in the United States itself, in the country who was the architect of such multilateral institutions as the IMF, the World Bank, and the United Nations, the current political leadership sees more promise in the targeted, well-focused measures such as the proposed Global Agreement on Sustainable Steel and Aluminium, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, and for the Partnership for America's Economic Prosperity. The last fall edition of Foreign Policy magazine is titled Alliances That Matter Now. In the article written by the magazine's deputy editor, Stefan Tail, we can read that the war with Russia has also accelerated the emergence of new partnerships. China and Russia are growing closer 
although they have not yet concluded a formal pact. <coughs> Similar to the West, they are building structures to tie in allies and partners, including a newly expanded BRICS and Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The most creative and dynamic form of international cooperation is the new minilateral groups, such as Quadrilateral Security Dialogue and the Australia-United Kingdom-United States Pact. As C. Raja Mohan, an Indian academic, journalist, and political analyst argues in the same edition of the Foreign Policy magazine, these are nimble, pragmatic coalitions that overcome multilateral paralysis why avoiding more formal alliances? This flexibility is particularly attractive for countries such as India, which is keen to preserve its strategic autonomy, even as it shifts into closer alignment with the West. Looking at the, the Global South, Stefan Tail continues. Of course, global problems still require global cooperation. Large parts of the world remain outside both old and new power box. But the weakness of alliances in the global south may be a feature, not a flaw. As long as countries are focused on development, it may be in their interest to avoid alignment and let the two geopolitical camps bid for their favors. Intra-African and intra-Latin America cooperation is relatively weak, perhaps because ambitious strategic actors capable of organizing regional cooperation and shaping transnational institutions have yet to emerge. Ladies and gentlemen, today in Brussels, we will see and maybe experience exactly what the deputy editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy magazine is talking about. We will explore what form of effective cooperation between the EU and the Global South or some of its actors is possible and mutually beneficial, mutually attractive. We will do so because the EU is increasingly aware of its own responsibility to address global problems as well as regional challenges. We Europeans appreciate that we are part of a strong bloc, the transatlantic alliance and of a, the wider West. However, this should in no way hinder us in our effort to seek, for, to seek new partnerships in new alliances in the region of the Global South. The Mercosur Agreement, completed in 2019 by representatives of the two blocs after 20 years of negotiations, offered promising prospects for the development of mutual trade, but also for deepening cooperation in the areas of migration and envi environmental protection. However, the ratification process of this agreement has shown how complex and challenging the issue of safeguards is for our economies. This doesn't mean, however, that we should give up on such cooperation. After all, even the trade agreement between the EU and our closest ally, the United States, known as TTIP, if you remember, has not been a resounding process. We can see how difficult it is to water down protective measures in the current relationship of several countries towards Ukraine. We are all helping Ukraine. We are backing 
heavily Ukraine. But when it comes to the protection of our farmers and their competitiveness on the global or world markets, problems arise. Look at Poland of these days, just to illustrate. So, dear friends, today we meet in Brussels in the hope of offering our political leaders, as well as our businesses and citizens in general, an attractive vision for the development of cooperation between the EU and the countries of Southeast Asia and Latin America. Remember, the journey towards a sustainable future is not a solitary one. It requires the combined strength, wisdom, and commitment of every region, every nation, but also every individual represented in this room. I am happy to see our guests representing India, Taiwan, Singapore, Uruguay, and Brazil, as well as representatives of the EU institutions and EU member states. I wish that this event be the catalyst for a new era of global collaboration with inspiring ideas where we move beyond Eurocentric solutions and embrace the synergies that lie at the heart of a truly sustainable future. Wishing us all a very successful conference. Thank you and the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you.